So that's where our strategy has shifted. So um, we've spent a lot of time in the past trying to convince people. And I've done a lot of reading in this area. And I realized one thing. Most people don't like to be convinced of anything. So that that actually goes counterculture to actually getting people to agree with you. So that's why we've now r- fully are, are vested and centered on social proof. I agree with Amir 100%. You know, it's so important to get that social proof from people. Actually, people that have experienced your your service, your product, and they enjoy it and they want to shout about it. We are totally overwhelmed, every single one of us, with millions of ads everywhere. Everywhere we look, we've got ads trying to convince us that we have to buy this product or service. After all, Facebook are making billions from all of us looking at their ads and also buying them. What I mean is purchasing ads. It's incredible to think that none of us really love them. (laughs) None of us love the ads. So I I found this interview with Amir refreshing because as a recruitment agency, he has a really tough job to convince people that they should be putting their CV with them or recruiters hiring him to find candidates. It's a really tough market and we had a really good debate about it. So I know you're going to really enjoy listening to Amir and his story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Amir. How are you today? Hey, Michael. Pretty good, thanks. How are you? I'm really, really good. And you're joining me from Orange County, California. Is that right? Uh, yes, sunny but cold Orange County. So it's uh, it's a little bit nippy, but the sun makes it look like it's uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit out there. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great when the sun's shining. Oh, God. We don't get much of that in the UK, but... Today, we did have a bit of sun, actually, so not too bad, (laughs) not too bad. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really interested to hear what you're all about because your organisation sounds really interesting and different. But before we get into that, um, we're going to go back in time a little bit. And I'd like you to tell the listeners a little bit about your personal life. So that means where were you born? A little bit about your education, you know, your family if you want to, but you don't have to, where you now live, how have you moved around, etc. And then, you know, when we get to that, we'll move into your first job and, and find out and we'll get into the career stuff. So over to you, Amir. Sure. Cool. Yeah, so uh, I was actually born on the uh, the East Coast of the States. So um, in, uh, in around the Washington, D.C. area, I lived there. Uh, most of my life, my parents were were immigrants. The classic, uh, you know, hundred dollars uh, to America story. Mm. Um, and and uh, I, I went to school on the East Coast. Uh, graduated with uh, you know technology degrees, a master's in technology. And um, my family was actually moving out west for my brother, who also is my business partner, but he was going to play tennis uh, at a university out in California in Orange County. And my options were to to take a shiny new job with Verizon at a, at a very nice uh, entry level starting salary, or turn that down uh, for nothing. Mm. <laughs> that was awaiting me in California, and uh, I kind of was like, you know what, you know, going to California would be nice. The the warm weather. Uh, so I, I the manager at Verizon, and I said, hey, sorry, I'm not going to take the offer. He kind of looked at me like, are you sure? Like, you know, it's a lot of money for kid coming out of school with no work experience. I was like, no, I'm sure. I, I think this is the right thing. Um, right. Came out here, uh, got here and realized, well, now I got no job I'm living with my family. That's nice. But uh, right, I got to find a job. So found a job, uh, you know, dug into the engineering side, um, slowly realized that while I, I, I could do, you know, software development and, and, and the sort, it really wasn't 
what was driving me. And um, I realized I enjoyed talking to people and the meetings and the prep work a lot more. So I started to kind of, you know, pivot into more of an analyst role, got into business intelligence where I could get in towards the, the, the business side of technology a little bit more. Um, and then gravitated towards at one point running a BI practice where I got a good taste for the sales process. And that's where I started thinking I could do this for myself. Um, made that decision to, to, to go out on my own. Um, again, my brother's my business partner, so it's, it's, it's a nice comforting factor to have him as a, a, as a backing. And then, you know, somewhere along the line, uh, early on, we, we got into recruitment and it kind of, it kind of became our thing, and that's okay, kind so, of uh, where we're at. Okay, so that that's a really quick <laughs> route through. That's it. Zero yeah. To 60. So, so tell me, what was the the what does BI stand for? So BI is business intelligence. Um, back in the day, uh, it was a little bit different than it is now, but obviously pro- providing that basis to get reporting and analytics to business KPIs, metrics, that that sort of thing. Oh, okay. And and what? How did you get into that? Is that? I mean, is it that, that just looking for a job, or you were interested in doing that, or? So so when I when I got my master's degree, there was a concentration in um in 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 the data space, uh, you know, building data warehouses, which were kind of fundamental towards you know this that type of reporting. So I had a lot of I guess educational training when I when I got out. I, I, I didn't have an ex- experience to do that, so I became a software engineer. Mm. But I did see, like, you know, a little bit of a, an opportunity to to start helping um, in those areas of the company I was working for. And the, my manager was really fantastic, South African guy, and he uh, he gave me a crack at you know you know touching that side, and it just it, it just resonated more, and I just gravitated towards it. And then. Why did you decide to leave them? It, I mean, I was there for several years, and I think um, it was a smaller business. And I and I think um, I just had seen, I just had wanted to do a little bit more. So I, I was wanting to get into more project management, and I needed to go to a bigger organization where there was more complexity and more more just structure where they needed that level of project management. And again, I was really wanting to move towards the people side of of uh technology so i figured you know right i've got some analysis type of you know abilities project management kind of fits right in Mm. um and there there were far less uh you know uh consumer people you know centric roles as compared to there there are now so those are a few of the opportunities that i thought kind of fit my personality and what i was hoping to do so that's why i made that move right right and and why did you want to? What inspired you to go into the kind of people side of the work? You you mentioned you then set the business up with your brother, but what 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 made so, you? What interested you to go into that sector? So initially, Elevano started as a uh, as a business intelligence consulting firm. So that's ah, what we originally right. started at. So that was my expertise, um, and and that's what we we set off uh, to do. Along the way, uh, we had a we had a customer who basically said, "Well, right, the project's done. We just need someone to help us with this." And and we we knew very little of recruitment, honestly. I mean, I I had been recruited extensively all throughout my career, so I knew mm-hmm. it from that perspective. But I'd never actually done it. Um, and, and we're a small business at that point. And, uh, we said, sure, why not? We can, we can help you. We'll figure, we'll figure it out, obviously. But, yes. um, we kind of said yes. And that committed us towards wanting to succeed. I think, you know, for my brother and myself, you know, we're, we're really driven to succeed. So if, if we said yes, we knew we were going to be all in to ensure a, a, as much quality and we'd, we'd figure out what we had to do to, to deliver essentially yeah got it got it oh okay so and did they have like a massive project that you had to do for them or yeah we had some we had some bi work some business intelligence reporting and dashboarding and some like some fundamental data stuff we were doing and then obviously when the project was finished they wanted 
they wanted someone in-house to take over. And that's where I kind of saw, you know, that, that conversation came up of, Hey, can you guys help? And, um, you know, I, th- I think because we understood, uh, the, the, the type of person they're looking for, we felt comfortable in saying, Hey, yeah, that, that's something we can find. Cause we would, we would f- typically find that type of person for projects ourselves, um, for, for the consulting side. So we just figured it's a slight extrapolation, um, from finding it for ourselves to finding it for somebody else, which there's some truth and, <laughs> and some, uh, false to that statement but overall i think that background helped us and then so did you in essence because this is how startup businesses get their lucky break i reckon <laughs> you know, it's when you actually cut your teeth on an existing client on a new kind of project and then you discover actually i could do this for other people as well how, how did that evolve for you yeah, so we, I mean, obviously with very little industry knowledge, uh, my solution to that was, well, I want to talk to people who, who've done this. So, mm-hmm. um, so I, I went about, you know, trying to, to talk to a few people that I had connected with from my days as a recruiter. I kind of asked some questions, try to figure out what tools they use, how they go about, you know, procuring people. Um, so I, the, the landscape has shifted in, let's say, the the six six seven years since that, six years since that. So sure. the tools and techniques back then made sense, and we kind of said, "All right, well, well, we can go purchase the tool and um, start using it." And and basically, I approached it as I was an internal hiring manager. I mean, that's how I had to gravitate towards recruitment. Was okay. I'm going to hire this person for me, for my team, for the BI consulting arm. How would I, what would I be looking for? How would I actually go about finding this person to expand my own team? Because if he, if I felt comfortable enough that he, he or she would be a good fit for my team, then I would feel comfortable sending that candidate to the client to, to interview. So we, we just took ownership based on if it's good, if it's, if it's a good hire for us, especially knowing the data space. And that's kind of just how we operated initially. And that's actually transcended the business like part of our fabric is we really take ownership of the roles in terms of trying to you know put ourselves in the hiring manager manager's position a lot of times yes okay and then you learned your craft that way and so elevano is a platform or what is it so we are a recruitment we are a recruitment agency. Um, we we don't operate much like most agencies, I suppose. There's some commonalities. There's some differences. And and again, I don't come from the industry. I'm a, I'm an engineer who mm. who comes from the perspective. Of I know what I liked from being recruited, and I know what I didn't like. And there's a lot of obviously stereotypes about the industry. You know, whether you're an engineer, or accountant, or any industry, you've you've dealt with recruiting. So we just we just set about going. How would we want recruiting done? And and that's what we want to stick to. Some obviously some commonalities, right? You can't you can't get away from some things, but uh, we we approached it from the standpoint of of that. And then obviously coming from a consulting background. You know, we we really like to dig in and understand. So, you know, in essence, that's kind of part of who we are, and and that's kind of into the training that we provide people when when we bring them on board is to help them understand those gaps and and kind of the mindset that we expect here to kind of resonate with, you know, being true to our own history. Got it. Okay. And and is it do you do you use? I mean, b- because you're. Um... Um, let's put it this way, you you are a, a kind of a technology person. Your, your route for getting people on board, so getting candidates and then getting those candidates in front of recruiters, What what is the process in terms of, you know, how much technology is involved with that? So I, I obviously, yeah, the, uh, I like leveraging technology. So we're not a platform. No. We had thought about, we actually had thought about many times uh, converting the service to a platform. And, okay. and, we, and we might still do, um, 
down the road. And and part of part of that is you know being an engineer, being somebody who you know is good at dissecting problems and and trying to reverse engineer solutions. I do see the gaps pretty pretty soundly and. I have used my engineering background to go find tools and technologies and, you know, process tweaks that, that leverage that. And I always joke internally, I'm, my goal is to use sort of step ahead on any tool that's out there before another recruiting company can, can, think about it, see it, you know, because obviously I'm digging into a lot of startups and technologies that are emerging that are still risky, but I can evaluate because of my background. So that does give us an advantage. So I, I do believe that's a distinct advantage. Um, and also with the engineering background, I was able to help the company, you know, with actual automation. So we've actually incorporated um, sales automation into our process where the staff actually spends less time. So again, not a platform, but I could take that component and build it into a platform and it probably would result in uh, a similar dynamic time saving for somebody else. So we, we see that as a big advantage. Um, and I think moving forward, you know, we're actually kind of looking at some other stuff again, you know, trying to keep that quarter step ahead of the market because you got to be able to differentiate out there some way. Of course. Yeah, of course. And Okay, so if if you haven't got a platform, how do you do the automation? It, or is that yeah. the secret sauce that you can't no. reveal? <laughs> no, there's there's the, I mean the secret sauce of how, you know how we particularly implement it. I mean, yeah, that might be a little bit you know protected, but in terms of yes. I mean there's there's plenty of APIs out there um, which are basically hooks into other systems that let you have the two systems, three systems, four systems talk to each other. Right. Um, that allow you to, you know, uh, uh, allow some of the mundane and trivial tasks to be overtaken by that automation. So um, I think because I built software, my job was to, and it's, what's interesting is software engineers they actually spend a lot of time looking at the business to understand the business problem they're solving and moving into business analysis. My job was to sit with business people to understand the workflow, the process, how they did their job. Yes. So I became very well equipped at dissecting problems and breaking them down to, to basic building blocks. So it's been a very good background to, to come into recruitment and see some of the gaps that were obvious and then some of the gaps that I looked at and I said, well, I don't like doing this. Well, the reason I started the automation test, if I'm going to be honest with you, is most software engineers are, uh, they want to automate stuff for the sheer sake of not wanting to repeat tasks because they want to be efficient. So I, I didn't like some of the repeated tasks that I was having to participate in. So mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. went about and automated it for myself and I saw that it worked for everyone. And it was, uh, you know, maybe like a seven to 10 hours of per person time saving that we now can apply towards much higher value activities versus other agencies who are still, you know, having to put that overhead onto their individual people to, to do that type of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, typically, I mean, what, what's your view? I don't know. I don't know what the reputation is of recruitment agencies in the USA, but I can share with you, once I hear from you, (laughs) I can (laughs) share with you how people look upon recruitment agencies in the UK. How how do people perceive you as an organisation in terms of how you can be adding value? Because... For the simple reason that everybody is looking to save money, you've got, you know, we connected on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a huge organization. They've got their own recruitment engine to help people, um, you know, save money and reduce the amount of time wasted in looking for people. So I guess there's a double question there. I'll ask the first one. What are people's, what are organizations' perception, do you believe, of recruitment agencies in the U.S.? So this is the tricky part, right? So I own a recruitment agency, um, but my perception of recruitment agencies are that they have a very poor reputation. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to draw analogies to any other industry, so we'll stick with its own industry, but 
too too much mistrust exists from uh, the candidate pool. So there's actually two issues. The candidates who, who have mistrust over the motives of the recruiters, because obviously third party recruiters are motivated by cl- commissions and closes. So that overrides a, a lot of the conversation. And then hiring managers also, you know, there's a lot of mistrust because they bring people in thinking there's expertise or they have knowledge of how to you know, get people in faster. And all they find is that they basically gave the, the, the third party recruitment company a, a job where now they have to go and run a just in time search. We have far less specialized uh, recruitment agencies here than you guys do in the UK market. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a little bit of a difference, more generalist here. Yes. But I'd say from both both customers, the the, the hiring teams, the managers and and the candidates, I, I do believe that they are skeptical that we provide any value. And that's actually us. That's forced Elevano to kind of swim upstream, and and shout at the top of our lungs that, okay, we're this tiny grain of sand and on the beach, but there might be some differentiations that is of value to you guys. But obviously, you know, the industry's so large and big that we do get drowned up. But I'm hoping that you know our techniques, our approach, you know, resonate with our audience and. Um, in the to capturing Google reviews uh, before we'd been doing them through email. And I said, that's not enough social proof for people. People need to see the validation uh, on, a, on a public platform with transparency. So we made a big push in the last four months to ask our candidates if, if, they've, if we've done a good job, write reviews. And in four months, I think we amassed close to 100 reviews written for us. And and not all of those reviews are placements. Those are people that were happy in the way that we approach them in our unique philosophies of recruitment that they were willing to write a couple of nice words about us. Yeah. And sorry, because the, the audio just cut out just very briefly. And where are all those reviews? Did you say Google? Google, yeah, we, we focused, I mean, Google for us, Facebook, Trustpilot, but I'd say right. the majority are on Google. And, and the reason we sent on Google as the big again is um, you have to have a, a user profile. Um, it ties back to person. For me, the social proof and transparency is is of imminent importance to establish that good practices can be done. And again, what I really like about our our candidates is we sometimes have one meaningful conversation, and that person is willing to write us a review. So I think whatever we're doing training our staff it's it's different and 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 our candidates are telling us so i think i feel that even though the recruitment industry does have a certain reputation and i do know there's some other agencies out there doing good quality work i'm not going to say we're the sole one that'd be a very myopic selfish view of everything but i do believe people uh, unless there's a direct change within the operations of how third-party agencies work that leaves us very susceptible to new tech that will be emerging. I mean, right now the new tech is okay. It's it is a threat. It's taking business away. But as as the the, the AI uh, 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 you know, applications to recruitment really get good, that is going to be a massive threat down the road. Hmm. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because there is um. So I'll share with you now the the view in the UK definitely is we have um, again this is there's not the similar correlation but in the UK um, consumers let's call them consumers don't think very kindly of and we call them estate agents and you will call them realtors so we don't have a very good view of them because they're just in there for the commission and they charge big commissions and they don't they don't do a very good job to help people get property and they don't and actually I've been on the receiving end of realtors in America and it's totally different so I can't draw the same correlation for the US but in the UK estate agents and recruitment agents are seen as the same kind of family in terms of they do a poor job they do very little and they're only interested in their commission and they will pander to the candidate to a point that 
you know, once once they're placed, then that's it. There is no more contact with the candidate. Only if the candidate doesn't like the job and they come out of it and they need to find another one. Because all they're interested in really is getting the, com the commission from their from the employer. So, and and it's interesting you say there is a mistrust, and that's that's I think the key thing, isn't it? It's if you're able to develop a trust with the candidate as well as the recruiter company, then that's a major breakthrough in the kind of industry, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I agree with you, and and I think here, so it's interesting. Uh, real estate agents here in the states. Um, Obviously, they're incentivized. For, I mean, it's a sales role. Mm. Um, so and they're incentivized, right? They want you to close. But I think it's such a, a personal decision that they they know they cannot hard sell someone without that person wanting to walk away. And then to couple that, we have so many different platforms that have emerged. Um, Zillow, uh, Redfin, there's so many platforms to buy and sell homes online that real estate agents have done a very good job of quickly, you know, becoming, realizing their role, realizing that the transactional side is, is diminishing and they've, they've evolved and they're becoming other, you know, they're becoming experts in, in their area. So they want to provide that value where if the transaction's been simplified by the internet, where do you pl provide value? Well, you better be an expert in knowing the market. And knowing, you know, having potential inventory or leads of inventory that's not on the market. So they've been very good in the States of knowing what they need to do to evolve. I think with recruitment, it's still, I mean, if you go back maybe, you know, to the 40s and 50s where everything was a newspaper ad, there'd be a help on it. You circle it and you'd, you know, mail in your cover letter uh, and resume that that transformed to. Uh, a fax number where you faxed in your resume and that, mm. that became a, yeah. hey, you know, email it. We're going to put that same job description on our web page. Email us your resume. Mm. It's been it's been a very slow evolution in actually doing something that you go has come. And people thought, let's do video jobs. And mm. it's that. That's um, and, and, and then on the recruitment side, because recruiters cannot use the brand of the company. They're basically, if you have, let's say, a job with Nike, and Nike's posting that job with their brand and their audience and their pull, and then you have Joe Recruiter's company who's posting that same job on behalf of Nike, that's a real problem. That's mm -hmm. always been the problem. And mm -hmm. that's the thing. I mean, if you talk to candidates, they hate that about recruitment agencies. Who's the client? Number one question a candidate will ask, who's the client? Uh, I can't tell you. It's confidential. Oh, really? Okay. Um <laughs> So I can't tell you because, you know, essentially I don't, if I tell you and you go apply directly, I lose my commission. That's the fear. That's, let's just call the, uh, call, call that 800 gorilla pound gorilla in the room out. Cause that's yes. the big fear is they don't want you to go around them. But if as a recruitment agent, whatever your title is, if you're doing a good job and you're an advocate and, and that candidate believes that you can deliver value based on being an expert in whatever it is you're representing, whether it's market, whether it's company, then why would they not want somebody who they are not paying to go do all the legwork, do all the setup, do all the negotiation, do all that work for them? But that is all predicated on them believing you're going to deliver. Otherwise, they don't want to put their career in your hand if you're not going to be able to deliver to their confidence level. So yes. I think... I think there's a there's some massive gaps from basic tradition that hasn't been cracked in the industry, which platforms like Hired.com and similar to that, uh, Indeed.com has its mm. own hiring platform. So they're trying to kill off the transactional piece of the recruitment industry. The challenge with that, obviously, is they still need somebody to talk to that person to see if culturally there's a fit, right? So it's not going to be like, well, here's candidate A that the, the system has generated. Both both algorithms and everything have matched. It's perfect. Hiring manager isn't going to just say, sure, show up tomorrow. I want to work with you. Because yeah. still in a personal nature, they want to know if that person fits their team, they get along, et cetera. There's nuances to you know the, the work being done there that maybe the algorithm can't capture. So there's still a people component that comes in. Yes. And I think that, you know, again, going back to the estate agent example, 
that transactional piece is getting killed off and it will happen in the recruitment industry. So it really comes down to what value add. And if you don't have the brand, you're not a, you can't advertise the Nike swoosh on your job ads, then you're in a lot of trouble because now you're just competing on speed and against, you know, multiple other recruiters that have multiple, multiple agencies working on the same order and they're all not able to use the Nike brand compared mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's funny because you're also competing with other agencies that have the same role, and then you're competing with the client themselves. So if you really think about it, that's a really that's a real problem. It's like you're a state agent; the owner is going to sell the home on their own, and you're going to also try to sell the home for them. That's right. Well, there's a that's a big conflict of interest because obviously they'd save money if they could sell it themselves. So there's some root fundamental issues to the system that that obviously. I'm not going to change as a as an owner of a you know under ten uh, recruitment agency, um, but I, I can identify them and I can take advantage of those as as the drivers and differentiators for us. Absolutely, and it's it's really interesting because I've 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 been quite outspoken about recruitment for many many years because I've seen it done very very badly for many years and and i'm not necessarily talking about the recruitment agent necessarily but i'm talking about the organization who's employing the individual i i'm always so amazed that the interview is only ever one way with that i mean that you go to see the employer and the employer asks 90% of the questions of the individual, the candidate, to see if there is a fit instead of the other way around, right? So years ago, I wrote this article as a blog post to say, A, we need to flip the interview process. That means, and what do I mean with that? One, when the candidate candidate goes to the organisation, instead of being interviewed by the hiring person, they go into the organization and they get interviewed by the team that they're going to work for. And they spend half a day going around the organization, speaking to key team members who interview them. And at the same time, they are also checking out those individuals. I know this is a really long process, but I say it for a reason. And they also check out those team members to see if they like them and there is a fit there. And they will ask questions of them as well. Whilst they're going around the organisation by understanding the organisation, they also should be looking for areas that um, things are going wrong. You know, they can point out areas for improvement. Whilst they're going around, they're keeping an ear and an eye on stuff that they notice and hear. At the end of the day, or lunchtime, right, so they're here half a day, lunchtime, they go out for lunch with the hiring manager and their team, and they talk about personal stuff. No work stuff, just personal stuff. So tell me, what are you interested in? What are your values? What is the organization values? What do you guys do as a team outside of business? And and they have this kind of whole general conversation. And then... In the afternoon, the hiring manager sits down with the individual and goes, okay, tell us everything you've learned whilst you've been here and you have any further questions. And there's no need to, the hiring manager doesn't have to interview because the next day or whatever, he goes and speaks to the team and says, do you like this person or not? And the reason that everybody has to put in so much effort, if you hire somebody on the basis of an hour's interview, which is all that people do most of the time, and they join the organization and they are not a fit and they leave after six months, you have wasted a ton of energy, time and money instead of investing it right at the beginning. Invest the time, energy and money at the front end and that person may last for a number of years. People never stay forever nowadays, but they might stay there to five, ten years with the organization and grow. So I'm sorry I'm speaking a lot here, Amir. 
<laughs> no, I like I like the thought. I mean, I think I think it resonates. It's a it's an identification of part of the the well. I mean, part of what part of what really is the core is that sometimes you know the hiring team is never trained on how to hire. So mm-hmm. that that actually is a is a problem. So I mean, if you're going to talk about what you just identified, and I agree that 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 uh a more realistic view of the job. And I think there, the technology there can help with that. So I think there's different things that an organization can do to help with that side of the house. But on the mm. flip side, we're asking people whose job is to do the job because they know the job to be able to identify someone who could do the job. And hiring is, is a very distinct activity. So when we hire people internal for Elevana, we've actually spent time creating a framework where we can score people based on competencies that we know are, in, in, you know, just a necessity for them to have t- to come in and be successful. So if they don't pass the competencies and and you don't have a defined process to how to score and how to identify what a eight out of 10 or versus a 10 out of 10 or a four out of 10 can, it looks like then obviously you could get the wrong hires. I do think though, it depends also what you're hiring for. So if you're hiring for a role where it's very difficult to assess skill, then I think there's big risks. I think for, let's say a skills-based job where you're an accountant or an engineer, where it's obvious if, if they can perform to a certain level, but even then, obviously they get it wrong. Mm. it's just difficult. I mean, there's a lot of, on the engineering side, I could tell you, there's a lot of exams and tests and whiteboards and coding samples they they investigate. So they've seen that shortcoming, but still they get it wrong because obviously, you know, humans are evaluating humans. Yeah, exactly. So I I don't know where the, the, the future of recruiting is going because... To me, it looks quite fragmented in terms of, you know, you've got these platforms that are trying to do a job and then you've got recruitment agencies trying to do a job. And I think people are confused and they don't know where to go necessarily. So how, if you if you had to, this is your opportunity then, if you had to pitch to, you know, a recruiter, Who's looking for the type of people that you're placing? What? How would how would you convince them, and that they should be coming with you rather than go to some platform, LinkedIn, Indeed, or somewhere else? So that's where our strategy has shifted. So um, we've spent a lot of time in the past trying to convince people, and I've done a lot of reading in this area, and I realize one thing most people don't like to be convinced of anything. So that that actually goes counterculture to actually getting people to agree with you. So that's why we've now r- fully are, are vested and centered on social proof. So the word of mouth of others. So if you're going to go use an example of a, a, an Italian restaurant, the Italian restaurant can tell you all day that they cook the best plate of pasta in the UK. They could tell everyone on earth, but until somebody's eaten it and somebody's validated and and multiple people have, then it's really just them trying to convince you to give it a shot. So our view is instead of trying to go out and try to convince people on an individual basis, we want to have the social proof speak for our quality of work. And and that's where we want to hang our hat. So we want to move away from having to convince an engineer. I, I just say, hey, go look at the reviews. If the reviews don't make sense, if you don't appreciate what's written there, then you probably shouldn't work for us because the what service we provide probably wouldn't resonate for you. Mm. And if it does make sense for you, then absolutely. We're the, and that's for clients as well. I mean, I want them, I, I want our salespeople to use the answer of go look at the Google reviews. I mean, these are real people that wrote them. We can't write them. We can't make them up. They're not just like a lot of recruitment companies have reviews on their website that are anonymous or first names or John's company like i mean that could be written by anybody else there's no validation Mm. um so so we take in the opposite stance of yes okay we will try to convince people it's still sales we want to you know get in there but we really want to start leveraging social proof and and for people to understand that 
that something has to be happening behind the scenes if, if people are happy. And again, any other business in any other vertical wants the customers to validate. Again, the, you know, the food industry is the perfect example. You, you, you would not go to a place that on Yelp or uh, similar uh, had a two star out of five star rating for food because you would assume the masses have spoken and it's probably not a good place. Maybe if your buddy tells you, yeah, you know what, they have a couple of good dishes, let's go try it. You go give it a shot. But a place that's five out of five with a thousand reviews, you're like, okay, I mean, why wouldn't I go try that place? Obviously, a thousand people have vetted it out. As long as it's you know authentic and trusted reviews, why wouldn't you do that? Is is there a um, like trip advisor for the recruitment industry? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> uh, no. There's there's not. Um, and I think the reason. So uh, yeah, there's not. There's uh, not. I've actually thought about that too. Should there be? And yeah. I'm like, that would be that would be a very scary platform to have wouldn't because. It? Yeah, that'd be that'd be terrifying. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'd also say that if you if you look up, there's companies out there that have really good Google reviews, and you can you know the Facebook Yelp reviews, whatever it is that they've put up to capture those. There's companies out there that you know you could see how they do, and and obviously that's a good indication. Um, and then you'll see companies that have like nine reviews, and you're like, well, why are people not running to write reviews for them? Like well, that to me is a negative. Mm. Um, Glassdoor, you know, even though it's about internal people, I mean, it shows you how people are. I mean, if you know, if people are happy working for a recruiting company, then I'm hoping that they're obviously doing something right to be kept happy to hopefully convey that branded message to other people. But you get a lot of recruiting companies, you know, Glassdoor ratings, and they're not very good either. And it's because you know managers are pushing you know, sales above everything else. I mean, you know, uh, lots of pressure. Uh, obviously, we're for you know, profit business at Elevano. I enjoy uh, making revenue and profit like any other business owner. But there's a there's a short version of the game and a long version of the game. And uh, I, I want to be a part of the long version. And, and the short can have a little bit of volatility, but the long, I mean, I want to do, I want to be in business for 50 years, not maximize whatever I can for an 18 month stretch and then, you know, burn it all to the ground in, in, in the consequences of that. Yeah. So I just had a quick look because <laughs> I was curious. So I've just been on to Google and wow, you got 130 reviews and the average is 4.9 out. That's out of five, correct? Correct. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's amazing. And and thank you. And that's that's since September. So we were joking. We have a lot of emailed uh, reviews that we were capturing. Mm. And uh, we were actually joking that if we had done this probably for the last five years, we probably would have, you know, maybe 2000. Mm. But um, but we recognized the strategy shift uh, sometime last year that, you know, we just there's not enough transparency. And I always talk about lack of transparency. And I said, what am I not doing about this? Like, I'm not addressing transparency. Mm -hmm. I'm complaining about it. I identified it. But what do I do to address transparency so that uh, that becomes a cornerstone, not just of me speaking about it, but actually of who, who we are as a company. So in, in the now, I guess, six months, maybe uh, September, I guess, almost six months, five months, we've amassed, you know, 100. And that's only out of, you know, we're only about six people in the company. So yeah. if you imagine if, you know, if we were double that size, we'd do more, but, but I think we are doing excellent with, you know, the strategy of, again, focusing on transparency and honesty, obviously that's resonating to resonating to the, the customers and the candidates we're working with. Wow. Fantastic. It, it's really, really impressive. I've, and what, the reason I like it, and I, I'm really grateful for you sharing it because there's a lot of small business owners listening to this podcast and, you know, everybody wants their product, their service to be bought, right? And how do you get the best way of doing that in terms of sharing that information? And, and I like what you say, and I 100% agree with you. People don't like being told, you know, buy me, buy me, buy me, advert, advert, advert. All they need to see is the social proof, which actually is 
you know, what are people saying about you? Why are they clicking five stars? I mean, OK, somebody somewhere along the right did did four stars, but the average 4.9, that that's very, very high across such a large cross section of people, even 130, I would say is large. So thank you for that tip. That's really awesome. Yeah, honestly, thank you. I appreciate you know the kind words. I, I'd say any business that that is operating, uh, I think two things are the cornerstone. So one is you need to get the social proof and validation. That's mm -hmm. I think immense. I mean, I I'd, I'd actually look at most, um, let's say more you know doctors, lawyers, you know food places. Those 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 type of businesses know they need that. I think there's a lot of other companies that don't realize how important that is, uh, especially services or non-traditional, you know, products being sold, that review is immense now. Like people are conditioned to want to see a review for everything. You go on Amazon, I wonder how many reviews it is before I buy it. You're not going to buy the two-star product. You're not. You're going to buy the four and up. You're going to look for the reviews to see if they're authentic. You're going to see what the worst is. That's how society shops. So why is that not applied to almost every other service or every other product. I mean, it has to be, and that is yes. what what's going to increase. And then I think, like, for us, because we work with recruitment, a lot of times our audience won't engage with us on on social media. So, because obviously they want to know, you know, they don't want other people to know they're looking, right? It's kind of a you know weird thing if you know they they respond. It's a little bit of a tell. People are going to see their social media. So sometimes I think, you know, for us, we produce content that's not visible but it's effective for what we need and i think a lot of companies don't produce content because they're afraid they're not going to get likes or retweets and they're overly focused on seeing that metric and i am and i really think almost any business out there needs to find the content that resonates with their audience produce it even if it's not public or if it's even used internally as collateral privately it doesn't matter content's content Produce the content, get it out there, because I promise you, shop. people are shopping with the same consumer behavior in every facet of anything that they purchase or, mm. or, or want. Mm. So I think people look for information and they look for social proof. Without the two, that's when you have to go out and convince people on a one-to-one -one basis that they should give you money. Yes. Yes, yes. And that's never going to happen, right? <laughs> that's hard. That's a hard, hard sell, especially if you have a commodity service. Uh, I mean, what's not commodity? I, everyone goes, you have a commodity. Well, there's very few things that are not commodity. Facebook is not commodity. There's not an alternate platform really that competes having two and a half billion people as uh, you know users of the platform. Mm. But you know, if you want to buy office chairs, that's commodity. If you want you know, window washing done, that's commodity if you want recruitment. So, I mean, it's, there's, there's multiple options. Uh, even I'd argue Facebook, as big as they are, they're cognizant that tomorrow some two teenagers sitting in, uh, you know, their home somewhere in the world could come up with the next platform that destroys them. So they know that they must validate and continue to improve. They can't just rest. So uh, I, I really think it's one of those where, the consumer behavior has shifted so greatly that there's now commonalities and that actually is easier for us to sell across those commonalities because people are using similar barometers and behaviors to buy. Whereas before you're like, well, somebody who's buying services is only looking for these factors. Let me give them the, my, uh, uh, you know, service values, uh, document and, uh, hope that that's good enough and they'll maybe get on the phone with me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very interesting indeed. Okay, so Amir, what what plans do you have or vision do you have about or opinion do you have about the way that recruitment is going? How do you see the future for recruitment agencies or recruitment per se? And then how do you see the future for you as an organization? So I maintain that recruiting is just a marketing activity um, as would as it would be in any sales organization you need um, lead generation candidate generation so I think marketing and brand I think will ultimately define people who can help generate 
passive, you know, in, you know, inward bound applicants versus you constantly going out and, and doing the solicitation. I, I actually think at some point that most HR, internal HR teams will actually be made up of mostly content and marketing people. And there'll be fewer resources needed just to handle the inbound and and outreach and and you know nurturing of of candidate pools. I think a lot of that will shift because the content and again the the platforms will kind of kill off the transactional need for some of the basic recruitment activities. So for me, I kind of view Elevano. It's been an interesting testing ground to really. I mean, we haven't even talked about. If I told you that we get about uh, 90% open rates by our candidates on our email campaigns and and about close to 45% response rates, um, we spend zero on paid per click job boards. Mm. Um, that was a decision I made about, I'd say, a year ago. Um, those are things that we've learned how to do as like a, as almost like a testing lab. So yes. I kind of view whatever we've done, whatever we figured out is pretty valuable because uh <laughs> I, I don't hear many other agencies re- replicating what we've done so i actually think we probably spin off a second company that's it's a, an actual marketing company that helps you know recruitment companies whether internal or external do what we've done um so i think you know my my re- recruitment company will continue it'll be a strong brand and i think we're going to take our know-how and help you know, the Nikes of the world, not that they need our help probably, but just an example, but, you know, okay. actual brands internal to how they can get to the numbers we've gotten. And I think there's so many different techniques that aren't even remotely being used. So I think there's going to be a big convergence. And I think the platforms, AI will come for a lot of the recruitment industry and and eliminate some of that transactional and you better have a plan B. Yeah, right. I it's really, I. You know, I think you're you guys are brave with what you're doing. There's no question about it. And you're right that a lot of automation will reduce the need for some of the upfront hard work that is required. The question still is who as you say, is good enough inside organizations to do the correct work that's needed? Or will they just say, well, we'll just cut back our resources because we're not hiring every single hour of the day. We're only doing it either once a month or once a week or whatever. And therefore, we can go to Elevano and let them do all the hard work, pay pay some fees for that, because we know that that will save us money in the long run. Because A, we don't have to employ somebody to do this work. B, we know that once we get a candidate on board, they're going to last with us because Elevano have the right fit with, with how we're doing stuff here. And, and I suppose you have to go that route <laughs> to, to be uh, reliant on that, that, that way. So I'd actually say if, you know, what's, what's, and the reason I think we, we want to start a recruitment company that's focused on, well, a, a recruitment marketing company is I, I actually genuinely believe that if uh, a, a company uh, has a marketing strategy around long term nurturing of candidates and assuming that they're actually always hiring, that they're actually always selling their company, because obviously, you know, People might hire now, but in six months or two months when you need to hire, if you treat that as a just-in-time activity, you're going to get just-in-time results. So I think um, if if I were an internal brand, I would actually argue that there should be zero money being spent on recruitment agencies if the strategy, the marketing strategy internally was done correct, which probably sounds horrible as a recruitment agency yes. owner. <laughs> but I firmly believe because there isn't a a actually longer term marketing plan and it's a lot of this industry is just in time mm. i think because of that people need to hire and they need to hire quickly so then they need to be reactive and going to get people in the door to interview right and that's where the urgency is for a na- recruitment 
you know, uh, agency to kick in is we're motivated by money. We'll go work hard. We'll get that candidate you might have not been able to get and we'll bring it to the table versus I think in a obviously it's a little bit, you know, of a uh, maybe utopian type of view of of uh, internal hiring. Obviously, I'm not internal, so I'm sitting in the cheap seats, but I do believe the marketing behind what happens at, at any brand should be focused on continuous hiring, not just cyclical, just in time. Mm. And I think that it's not a major investment. I think there's a lot of things they can do. Technology will allow for it. And I think um, there's simple strategies that that are not being you know, used by those companies. And that will actually reduce the need to turn to multiple agencies when they do. They will be able to work with you know, fewer partners because they will have they'll know where the needs will be. They'll be able to forecast that we need these type of partners because these type of roles are difficult and they can find maybe specialists. So I, I think there's a lot of things that can happen within, you know, internal marketing of of recruitment. And then obviously on the on the recruitment agency side, they better be better than the internal people at marketing roles and, mm. and how they're going to get around not having brands. So mm. You know, recruitment agencies aren't going to go away, but they better they better up their game as the internal people take away some of the audience that they that they were previously ha- asking for help for. If that yes. makes sense, yes, it does make sense. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating time, and I'll be really interested to follow your journey over the next three to five years and how that works out because it's. You're very courageous, I think, in in terms of what you're doing. But I also believe that what you're doing is setting yourself apart. And I I love the the kind of Google reviews route. I think that's really awesome. And that will certainly help you a great deal. Thank you so much for your insights and and your time. I I, I can talk for much longer, but I'm just mindful of your time as well. so let's let's draw to a close for now, um, Amir, but I, I look forward to keeping in touch. But before we go, could you share with the listeners where they could learn more about you, about your organization online? Absolutely. Yeah, firstly, I, uh, I think, Michael, we could literally speak uh, until my evening and through to your morning. It's been a, just a great <laughs> conversation. Uh, um, thank you for for just you know directing the conversation, the flow, um, the engagement's been fa- fantastic. So thank you for that and having My me pleasure. on in the first place. Um, to find me, I mean Amir Borman um, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. That's that's pretty much my handle. Um, if you Google me. Um, and then my company, elevano.com, E L E V A N O dot com. My first initial last name, A Borman dot Elevano dot com is my email. But uh, yeah, that what I what I view now is that my mobile device if you text me if you email me if you send me a message through any platform at all as an alert so it's it's fascinating that it all ends up on your phone one way or the other now that's right yes yeah, scary stuff scary stuff okay well thank you so much for spending the time and having a chat with me it's been absolutely fascinating and i look forward to seeing how your journey evolves over the next few years and definitely keep in touch with you. Thank you so much, Amir, and I'll speak to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 